Hey, what's up everybody? I was gonna do a Mandalore reaction today, but someone let me know that this dude exists, which is a... Uh, a sh he's a shammy. Okay. And uh, he said that he's better than Mandalore. I was like, whoa, whoa, big words there, huh? So we're gonna check out the video by Shammy. This is an actual review of The Surge. Okay, I played The Surge. It was supposed to be like the... It was supposed to be like a, a, a Dark Souls game, but okay, it's a Souls game, but in the future and you change up parts, you cut people's hands and legs off and stuff like that. I did not like it that much. I played the second one, did not like that one that much as well. I didn't feel as responsive, there was a lot of dumb shit happening. I was not a big fan of these Surge games, but I know a lot of people are, so let's see what he thinks. I don't know about any of you, but I find something about familiarity to be extremely comforting, and I'm sure none of you will be surprised to hear that Violent nothing gives me that good old familiar feeling quite like being halfway done with a review and realizing that I'm pouring well over a month of my life into talking about a game 17 people cared about when it was released, and maybe three still will by the time I've actually finished writing about it. No, Prey was released two whole weeks ago. There's no way anyone would listen to a review of that by the time you'd finish working on it. It's not Prey like there's already good. a precedent that proves otherwise right here on your own channel. Bitterness aside, I'd like to take a second to congratulate The Surge, because we haven't even started the actual review yet and you've already managed to impress me. After all, making me feel like spending a month reviewing ReCore was a smart use of my time is no small feat. Sure it's a shame you seem to have decided to stop there. Joke's on you, I was bitter the the whole time. The Surge is a pseudo open world, third person sci-fi action RPG with a focus on grinding, exploration, discovery, and combat developed and by Deck 13 Interactive. Death. A German studio best known for co-developing none of your goddamn business, cop. You got a warrant? Stop looking over there. It's also a game that I found incredibly challenging to critique because in addition to being very difficult to care about, its single most defining flaw is the way that it feels to play. And it's a bit hard to really nail down what makes a game feel bad, particularly when your IQ is lower than your height yards. I guess it'd make the most sense to start with the way it controls, given that it's a bit of an undertaking to make anything feel good when combat controls like you're just shouting suggestions at a drunk puppeteer with no hands. Actually, no, now that I think about it, the problems with the way this game controls rear their ugly heads well before you fight anything, which is actually somewhat impressive considering the way this game unceremoniously dumps you into the first combat arena before you have time to properly lower your expectations. Movement in general is just kind of clunky and awkward, it almost feels like the player controller is somewhat offset. As if you I aren't agree. actually controlling the character himself, but rather the area surrounding him. Which I guess could be the technical explanation for why random objects explode when you touch them with the air several feet to your right. But hey, who knows? Maybe there's an in-universe explanation that I'm just missing here, buried under several layers of obscure wiki pages and speculative blog posts that detail the microscopic nanite quantum shockwaves given off by the electrode module of your combat rig. It's my fault for not looking into it, really. Actually, on the subject of obscure WordPress blogs and wiki pages, I'd like to take a minute to derail my Myself entirely and talk about the game's story, more specifically about the way that it's told. Oh. The overarching. I actually don't remember anything about the game's story at all. I'm gonna be honest with you, I played the first, I beat the first, I beat the second game as well. I don't remember anything about the story. I remember in the first one you were a cripple, you were like a wheelchair dude that doesn't need a wheelchair anymore because you have like this thing on your back that moves your limbs and shit. So you, you go around and you know massacre half the people of the universe to get cooler legs and hands plot of Warren fighting his way through the Creo facility in order to figure out what happened is told fairly traditionally through scripted story events and interactions with other survivors via branching dialogue trees. Specifically, the form of branching dialogue trees and quotes you could brain a mech with, where the only meaningful choice you can possibly make is None. to skip them entirely. Take it yes. from me, I sat through every dialogue option and you're really not missing much. Oh, Essentially, every single character can more or less be summed up by prefacing a noun with the word confused. Confused drugs, confused science confused uh... guy a... what a... Dean Hobbes is one of the characters in the search good job wiki I like it I, I like the ad in the top right I went from this to this in three days with this one possibly illegal trick 
I like that. Whatever, you get the point. The supporting characters are all forgettable, sub one dimensional, and boring. And as a result, talking to them is time that could be better spent doing just about anything else. Speaking of sudden segues, let's talk about the game's actual story for a minute, because unlike the characters you encounter, it. there's actually a thing to say about it. The game opens with you, Warren, riding on a tram to start your new job at a facility owned and operated by a futuristic technology manufacturer by the name of Creo. On the tram ride, you're treated to a video assuring you that they definitely, absolutely totally care about you and your well-being and are the last bastion of hope for humanity. So if it wasn't clear enough by the overwhelmingly evil facility or the fact that a video game is going to happen at some point, you should probably realize from this that Creo is evil and that shit is about to go haywire. After the tram stops, you finally gain control of your character and it's revealed that you're actually wheelchair bound, which shook me to my carbon enriched core because it was both a nice reveal and an example of show don't tell done well in a video game. Sure, I sort of predicted it based on the weird first person flow camera the game stuck me in, but there are games sold entirely on their stories that don't understand how to do that sort of thing. Hell, there are games where characters spend the majority of the runtime explaining their personalities to one another who still That's come across as unclear and muddled. Meanwhile, upper body strength over here hasn't opened his mouth a single time and I feel like I at least have some understanding of who he is and why he'd so willingly ignore all the glowing neon warning signs in order to pursue a job at this death factory. There are even smaller mechanical details that play into it, like how the camera being so low to the ground helps the player empathize with Warren feeling small and vulnerable, and how he might look up at the security officers with inbuilt dishwashers and dream that he too could one day leave wine glasses shining and spotless. It's a great setup for a character-driven story about regret, <laughs> loss, misplaced trust, and the dangers of human desperation, so it sure would be a shame if this entire segment had fuck all to do with the rest of the game, wouldn't it? This segment uh... is immediately followed by a brutal cutscene of Warren getting his exosuit drilled onto his body while he's fully conscious until he blacks out from the pain and the game dumps you into the first combat arena and you can and walk fuck you fight these drones and you can walk best company ever like first day on the job bam legs I'm not even exaggerating. You go from train station to character torture to player torture in the space of two minutes and four seconds. I fucking timed it. If you're going to have an introduction lead into an in-media res, you should at the very least make the introduction relevant if you don't want it to wind up being both jarring and pointless. Char I mean, unless you enjoy being obnoxiously condescended to by pictures of owls on the internet who have never made a video game in their entire life. In which case, go hog wild. From here on in, the story has nothing to do with Warren outside of the fact that he's the dope running around braining ex-employees the metal rod trying to figure out what's going on. Which is good because the game only blew its storytelling load on making him empathetic, makes no sense to capitalize on that. After the power surge that sent everything fuckside, the remainder of the game shifts focus fuck from side. Warren to the current state of the planet and the company of Creo itself. And as we explore more and more of the facility, it's steadily revealed that even before everything broke down, Creo were operating well outside the law, morality, and ethics under the justification that uh, Humanity's greater good. Thanks for going slow with that one. I'm not the main character of a video game, so I'm not entirely sure my heart could handle the shock if you hadn't. During this exploration, you're spoon-fed information regarding Project Resolve, a program that promised to repair the degrading atmosphere but had to be recalled post-launch due to the fact that it had unforeseen lethal side effects. What these side effects were is never explicitly stated. Or maybe it is, but I don't care and you don't either, so why am I even okay. arguing with you about this? Let's just say I made copies of this game appear on everyone's computers and move on. After Resolve fell through, the scientist who created lethal. it was given the boot and Creo began work on its successor, Project Utopia. Except she didn't actually get the boot because you run into her later on when she tells you that Project Utopia needs to be stopped at all costs and gives you a chip containing a virus that will make it inert provided that you get it to the board of executives on time. I think I'm about halfway through the plot at this point and I'm starting to realize that I'm just listing off story events and then immediately moving on. And I'm sorry, but I genuinely have no idea how to talk about any of the things that happen in this game for long enough to say anything interesting about any of them. And I That's think I might hilarious. actually know why that is. This game has no emotional heart. Warren never has any kind of reaction to anything that happens around him. So story events are just that. Event. And like the combat in this game is basically... Okay, so how you get new parts, new weapons and shit like that is by cutting off enemies slims, which would be very, you know, like they could have had a whole plot system around how your character needs to, you know go through the whole thing of chopping up a, another human being to make cool ass armors and shit that's pretty fucked up right but they did not he did not give a fuck my boy was ready pretty sure he was in the fucking train on the way to the job in his little wheelchair being like oh yeah i wish i had 
a human being to chop up now. So yeah, you play as Hannibal Lecter. At a point near the end of the game, he discovers that the person he has spent the most time interacting with and the only person I think you could potentially argue that he's built a relationship with is actually an artificial intelligence unit who then subsequently crashes and fucking dies in front of him and he reacts like water being poured into a beaker of more water. And yeah, that is a spoiler and fuck you for pretending to care because even he didn't. There, consider that your warning because from here on in I'm going to be spoiling the rest of the game's plot so if you're really jonesing to experience the Doesn't story matter. of the surf for yourself then I guess this is your stop I'm sure all none of you will enjoy some of my other reviews take a good look around there's no rush as for everyone else don't worry there are only a few more events that are big enough to bother bringing up so I'm gonna try and wrap this up as quickly as I can eventually you find project utopia's creator and discover that the program is designed to infect human bodies with nanites which then feed off the human tissue and replace it from the inside out until only synthetic material remains after the transformation is complete the result is a new organism that would supposedly be able to survive on earth post-atmosphere degradation known as ho homo machinalis about that i don't i don't have time i don't have time long story short you find out that there's a rocket filled with these nanites poised to launch into the atmosphere and infect everyone on the planet so it's up to you and only you to stop it why the military hasn't shown up yet to take over i have no idea it's implied based on the amount of shit that's happened that there's actually a decently sizable time jump from the surge wrecking everything to warren waking up in the junkyard so why doesn't anyone from the military show up until the end credits this isn't some impregnable military fortress it's foxconn with better pr regardless after you discover that the entire board of executives are fulfilling your daydreams it's on you to make your way to the center of the nucleus in order to upload the virus yourself as you get closer to the nucleus you discover that the nanites from utopia never stop mutating and overriding the human material eventually erasing all memories consciousness and everything that was once human until all that remains is a mindless amorphous mass of nanomachines hellbent on spreading further weak to sticks on fire though so that's all right you work your way to the center upload the virus fight the rogue process hey there's so many nanomachines in this game you think it's it's Metal Gear Solid. It's the controls project Utopia, stave off the desire to take yourself out with it and finally get to the credits. And don't you look so relieved over there, motherfucker, because the story might be finished, but you can be sure as shit we aren't. Remember how I said I wanted to talk about the way the story is told? Well, outside oh, of those key no. moments, the bulk of the storytelling and world building is done in the background through the environment, which is another thing I actually Do like as a concept, suicide. because it's one of the few methods of storytelling that video games have a unique advantage over other forms of media in, as well as the fact that it feels much more natural and engaging than being beaten over the head with a wheelchair every time some kind of context or subtext is required to understand what's going on. Unfortunately, there's sort of a quote-sized problem with the way that The Surge handles its background storytelling, namely the fact that it seems to have bigger dreams than being a featured extra. It wants to be a star. So, since it's so desperate for attention, give me a moment to stop flailing wildly and focus up to try and at least partially explain why it's implemented about as smoothly as Warren's exosuit. The first method of environmental storytelling that most people are likely to notice are the TV screens placed all over the various areas that play videos featuring the chipper Don Hackett from the introductory section explaining how great Creo is and how amazing it is to work for them. There are different videos sprinkled throughout each area that provide a bit of insight into each of the level's purposes before everything went south, in addition to providing a bit more of an explanation for how Creo presented themselves publicly in order to get away with everything. Sounds great, right? Well, what if I told you that these videos are loud, unavoidable, play on a 20 to 40 second loop every time you enter an area they're located in and are so plentiful that I remember the dude in them's fucking name. These videos are about as intrusive as non-direct storytelling can possibly be. The game even wrestles control away from you and forces you to stare at them if you have the gall to try and pick something up in the vicinity of one of them. Not to mention the fact that they feel as though they've been thrown in without any consideration as to who they're even there for. Is Creo giving- Okay. I gotta be honest, I was blasting Linkin Park while playing through this shit. I did not hear a word this motherfucking TV told me. tours day in and day out that aren't curated by a guide or are these here for the employees if it's the latter i can't really say i'm surprised by the state everything's in if i worked a job where i had to hear some prick smugly tell me about how great i've got it on a 40 second loop day in and day out i'd go fucking ballistic and no amount of surge protectors taped to my forehead would have been able to prevent it either potentially even worse than all that is the fact that some of the other methods of background storytelling actually go so far as to remove the small level of intrigue any of the characters had to begin with 
Yeah. For instance, the first time you make your way through the game's main hub area, you'll likely stumble across this woman, whose name I cannot for the life of me remember, so I'm just going to call her free public Wi-Fi, because based on the shit she says, anyone can connect just fine, but if you walk away with a virus, you've really only got yourself to blame. When you first stumble across her in-game, she's digging around in the garbage looking for a staff, and if you go find one for her, she'll reappear at a few different points later on and reveal that she was an engineer. But as the game goes on, Oops. you'll eventually find her clad in security armor, babbling about orders and lockdown. And while Bitch Goes Crazy isn't exactly the top rung on the ladder of quality character arcs, it's at least something. It adds some small level of intrigue to a game devoid of intriguing characters. Has she been running around murdering and chopping up security guards to Frankenstein together the armor she's wearing? Has she been killing security officers? I mean, can we really blame her? It's pretty much what we do in this game the whole time. We just kill people, chop up their limbs, attach them to our hands. So. The entire time? Is that why they're immediately hostile? Also, if all of the other guards are immediately hostile toward Warren, will taking on this persona cause her to eventually snap and turn on you, forcing you to kill one of the only people in the entire facility that you thought you could save? As it turns out, these aren't actually questions I wanted the answers to, because it's revealed through an audio log that she just nicked the equipment and went on her merry way. Of all of this shit left unexplained. Why is that the thing you felt you needed to clarify? Especially when the answer is so fucking mundane. Without even going into the fact that someone making that audio log doesn't really make sense given all the other shit that had to have been going on at that time, they made both the character and world less interesting by adding more details to them. There's an almost poetic level of irony to that, like the fact that the cult awareness network is owned by the Church of Scientology, or how women who own horses have a tendency to be uns stable. Yes, I acknowledge that that is a total nitpick, what? but if you're going to invest this kind of time and effort into building things in the background, you should probably spend some of that time making sure it doesn't fuck up the foreground as a result. Look, I know that actual deep and detail-rich environmental storytelling takes a lot of time, talent, and effort, especially for something that will be completely missed by a decent chunk of the player base. But does a garden bloom overnight? Was Rome built in a day? We all know the answers to these questions. So who the fuck fuck thought that having the exact same video play every time you respawn in R&D was a good idea. Better yet, who thought it was a good idea to play the exact same part of the exact same song every single time you respawn in a game built around the idea that you're going to be dying a lot. Getting one shot by a normal mob because this game controls like a coat hanger abortion would have been infuriating enough if I wasn't immediately met with, I was born in a prison with no hope for escape. Do you get it yet? How about now? You don't get to lean Yo, on the one thing savage. you did properly when you do everything in your power to make it about as removed from the game's plot as this game is from the internet's radar. And I guess that all sort of leads up to a simple question. Is the story bad? Yes. yes but honestly not to an offensive degree. The characters suck, the world is hard to care about when there's nothing in it to connect with emotionally, there are a lot of smaller details that are key to the storyline that flat out don't make sense, and the timeline of events adds up about as well as a dyslexic child learning to use PIMDAS. However, contrary to popular belief, I do try to give credit where it's due, and to its credit, this game does do a pretty solid job of building up a mounting atmosphere of despair and hopelessness without feeling the need to hammer in that you're supposed to be feeling that way. Although, thinking back now, those feelings might have had more more to do with the gameplay than anything going on in the story. Yes, finally, the part of the review that person actually cares about, thank god. Now, before I so rudely interrupted me, I sort of touched on the fact that playing this game feels like playing bloody knuckles with a meat grinder. Or something along those lines anyways. Can't really remember my exact words. Wasn't there it's a wall a that just... Well, whatever. Wasn't there a wall that said do not suicide? My boy just did what the wall said not to do. How dare you? When I was talking about the way this game feels, I specifically talked about the way it controls. And I want to be clear here that I was talking about how the gameplay itself handles and not which buttons do what. Although don't you worry, I'm going to touch on that shit too. Let's start with the combat, since that's, you know the game okay this this what y'all saw there was my biggest problem with this fucking game enemies do these retarded swings they basically do this it's like you're fighting with the uh i can say that actually on youtube you're fighting with someone fuck how do i say? they do this they put their hand you, you pretend like you're gonna punch someone put the hand behind your back and do it fucking 360 that's most fucking enemies in this game's attack. So like, you dodge a little bit to the right and you're, you're like, okay, it's not gonna hit me, right? Nope. I fight like a whirlwind. 
It's bullshit. It doesn't touch on that shit too. Let's start with the combat, since that's, you know, the game. For the most part, the combat is designed around energy and stamina management and one-on-one -on -one combat with enemies in which you lock onto them and attack, dodge, parry, counterattack, and do that weird goblin hop to try and kill them before they can kill you. Had to block Brent Daniel. It's a shame, but I'm on them. I want to bigger and better people now. Is this about me? Why do you immediately send this about you? Just a general observation, Jesus man. Some people named Brandon who were you. Stamina management is pretty basic. Running, okay. dodging, attacking, and parrying all drain some amount of stamina, and running out leaves you more or less defenseless to enemy attacks. Where the game really gets interesting is the introduction of the energy meter, which is used for non-physical things like activating attack drones, amplifying your weapon's damage, applying elemental buffs, slowing down time, healing, and performing executions. There's a catch, though. This resource doesn't regenerate once it's used and can only be built up by performing physical attacks on enemies, which as a concept is honestly kind of brilliant. The bar itself is insanely dynamic in the way it affects the combat, and the idea that the only way to use it as effectively as possible is to have an aggressive approach to fighting is a really creative way of encouraging players to take a more active role in combat encounters. Unfortunately, this entire concept is butchered by the fact that the rest of the combat is designed in such a way that playing any way other than passively and pussily is more or less a guarantee that you'll end up with half a power loader staking its claim to your lower intestine. If you goblin hop yeah, when you're shot. supposed to gremlin squat, you'll discover pretty quickly that even normal enemies in this game can and will kill you in one or two hits. Which is fine enough if you're trying to make your game challenging, I guess, but if you're going to do that you should probably do everything in your power to ensure that fights feel like they're between the player and the enemy and not the player, the enemy, and the game itself. Aside from the fact that its design pretty directly conflicts with a lot of its concepts, one of the biggest problems I have with the combat in The Surge is that I don't think it's nearly tight enough to get away with being this punishing. The majority of weapons have wind-up times rivaling that of a politician, follow-through takes as long as see previous, and at the end of most of the attack chains you get locked into uncancelable multi-hit combos that keep going for full seconds after you've stopped pressing anything. <laughs> which made the decision of which weapons to use based less on how much I enjoyed their movesets and more on whether or not I'd be too senile to understand Warren impotently swinging into either an enemy's inescapable insta-kill combo or off the fucking map by the time he got around to it. Also, and this is optional and- And the thing is, the, the second game, same exact fucking shit. It does the same- it does the same fucking shit. Mostly they didn't unrelated, learn. but I wanted to bring it up anyways. They didn't For some learn. reason that I won't even try Fucking to understand, learn. you can turn on a setting that makes the game go all slow-mo for about half a second every time you hit an enemy, which I think should be classified as treatment for the clinically sane. Half the weapons in this game are already nigh unusable because it takes the better part of a dog's lifespan to swing them. How much free time do you think I have? Throw in the fact that injectables and healing items don't actually activate until about Oof. half a second after they say they do, and it all comes together to make one of the least responsible responsive feeling combat systems I've used in a very long time. Which is a big enough problem in and of itself, but it's compounded by how much damage just about every enemy can pump out. Exactly. Listen, the combat system is not as bad as he's making out to be. Um, like, the bad, the worst. A lot of games have shitty combat systems, but usually they're not as hard, because, like, they're not, not every game is souls like so. If the enemy did, like, a fifth of the damage they do, it won't be that big of a problem, because it won't be that hard, okay? But since it's a fucking punishing game, and if the enemy touches your little toe on the... You fucking die, okay? So... In under a second. This unresponsiveness isn't even restricted to the combat. Sometimes when a button prompt would show up to pick up an item, I'd have to fumble around for a few seconds before the game would actually let me pick it up. I know it's a minor complaint, but when you can't even get basic shit like that right, I feel like it's at least worth mentioning. As for the one-on-one -on -one aspect, there's actually more to it than just a heavy reliance on a single target lock-on mode. While you're fighting enemies, you can point the right stick in any direction in order to target unarmored body parts in order to boost your damage which is sort of a neat idea, but for the majority of the game, they don't really do anything interesting with it. Aside from dealing bonus damage when you hit unarmored body parts, it really doesn't matter which body part you're targeting. You can't try to disarm them by attacking the hand they're holding their weapon in, you can't try to daze them by attacking their head, and you can't try to cripple their movement by attacking their legs. And no matter what limb you're hitting, you do exactly the same overblown attack animation regardless. It makes the whole system feel a bit pointless, at least in terms of combat. Luckily, in terms of 
farming it's uncharacteristically utilized really well. Instead of having to rely on RNG for weapon or item drops, you can yeah, actively guarantee decent, that enemies will drop what you want as long as they have the item equipped and you have the wherewithal to take it. If you get an enemy below a certain health threshold and have enough energy, you can perform an execution by chopping off whatever body part you are currently targeting. And all those years in the wheelchair definitely seem to be paying off because Warren might be the only human being in existence who can tear a tank in half with a metal stick. Performing one of these executions will drop both a blueprint and parts for whatever weapon and or piece of armor the enemy was using provided that the body part you chopped off was either holding the weapon or wearing the armor. And unfortunately, this is where I have to stop being nice. I know, it was fleeting, but hang in there, <laughs> we can make it through this together. In concept alone, this system for farming is nothing short of fantastic. It gives the player control over something that's normally decided by an often frustrating roll of the dice. Where it starts to Dark fall apart is when it's actually put into practice. See, you're normally going to want to be targeting unarmored body parts during combat so that you're dealing the most damage possible and then switching to an armored part for the execution so that you can get the item and or materials that you need. The problem there is that it's not exactly a breeze to switch body parts while avoiding attacks and staying in range long enough to perform the execution because of how jank the controls for doing so are. You can either use the default option of sticky locking where you select a limb and the target doesn't switch until you do so yourself or manual targeting where staying on one limb continuously requires you to hold the stick in that direction but allows for faster and more fluid switching between limbs. And thank you Deck13 for giving me two uniquely terrible options to choose from. I had no idea you were so in touch with the ever patriotic American spirit that drives me. Sticky locking is unbearable because of how clumsy and awkward it is to try and get the game to target the correct limb after you've selected your first one. And manual targeting is barely any better because while it makes going touching spirit bear on the enemy's asses a bit easier it means resigning yourself to the fact that Warren will only actually target the limb you have selected for executions about once a generation. This is due to the fact that manual targeting increases your chances of accidentally hitting the wrong body part, and the success rate of targeted executions is based on the amount of damage dealt to that area before triggering it. Which means you get to choose whether this system is self-defeating for combat or self-defeating for farming. Fucking hell, you really do know me, don't you? If all that wasn't what? bad enough, the fact <laughs> self-defeating for farming. Fucking hell, you really- <laughs> you really do know me, don't you? If all that wasn't bad enough, the fact that this system is implemented in such a way that it's hard to control bleeds over into other aspects of the gameplay and ruins them too. Because the right analog stick is preoccupied with this system, target switching has been relegated to the left trigger, which you might think is an elegant solution if you're wrong and a moron. You could probably make it work if pointing the right analog stick in a direction and then pressing the left trigger switch to the next enemy in that direction. But the left trigger is a big boy and he doesn't want his older brother's help anymore so he just says fuck it and switches to another enemy in the area at complete random which makes fighting groups of enemies even more infuriating Oof. than it would nice be damage. regardless it's not like fighting without using the target lock is even a viable strategy the weapons crowd control like a substitute teacher and their damage is neutered if you aren't explicitly attacking unarmored body parts and the fact that your weapon swings are still slow as shit makes it several times more likely that they'll be interrupted when fighting groups of enemies whose attacks can and will overlap it's not like you're opposed to letting the right analog stick do other shit. You have to parry and flick the stick up or down to do the stupid vertical dodges. Oh. So why not make it do something that isn't rendered mostly useless by the fact that regular dodging is easier to do and works on every attack instead of 10% of them and parrying is piss easy as well. You've designed your entire combat system around fighting one on one and while it's definitely flawed for that it's at least functional. Why in the name of the entire fuck family tree are you throwing me into combat scenarios that completely break it? Is it because you want the game to be hard? Well congratulations, you made your game hard and only at the expense of making the combat an enjoyable challenge. Here's your stupid trophy for pasteboard. You fucked it. Award to the search for showing exemplary skill at fucking it under any amount of pressure. But what the fuck do I know, right? Maybe the combat feels phenomenal when you've been piped enough times to master it. There were a few moments here or there where fighting one or two enemies at a time actually felt really cool and rewarding. Maybe I should have just get it good, but maybe the game should have given me a fucking reason to want to. I've said this before, but there's a pretty big difference between challenging the player and doing everything in your power to obstruct them. I never felt a sense of accomplishment after getting through a tough area in the surge. Just a sense of relief followed by the realization that I had replaced my desk with an imperial fuck ton of cup holders. Even then, I don't think I can confidently say that this game is actually harder than...
Uh, Crash Team Racing. Not in any meaningful way, at least. Yeah, I died a lot. Gold star. But when I don't feel like all of the deaths were my own fault, I'm gonna be pretty hard pressed to give you any kind of credit for that. Honestly, I can't help but feel like the game's absurdly high difficulty exists Oof. almost solely as a means to stretch out its playtime. Because when I played through it the second off. time with the that. knowledge of where I was actually supposed to be going, I hit the halfway point in about three hours. Oof. See, because every level has only one med bay and thus one spawn point, the game doesn't track your progress throughout each area with checkpoints. It instead has the levels loop back around into themselves while unlocking unlocking shortcuts that make it easier to access the later stages as you move through them. Sounds sick, right? Well, in concept, you'd have pattern recognition skills more developed than that of a goldfish, but in practice, I attracted a lot of my audience by saying the funny fuck words, so I guess I should sleep in the bed I've made. Let me explain. Having levels that loop back into themselves over and over again is a neat enough idea, but for it to work, you sort of have to know whether or not you've been in this gray square hallway or gray square room or gray square ventilation. Yeah, that's why it works so well with so well, so well with Dark Souls because most of the levels in most of the dark well, you know, the Dark Souls games are completely different. So when you go from one level to the other, like the difference is huge. They're so remarkable i guess that's a pretty good word remarkable in themselves so when you go from a level to a level it, you see it you feel it in your soul in this game no you don't shaft before sure the actual levels themselves are pretty visually distinct from one another considering the setting but areas within them all blur together and make the experience as a whole more confusing and obnoxious than anything else even the nucleus suffers from this and that's the most well-designed level in the game by a baker's mile it's built around this really cool concept where the baker's med bay is on a massive freight elevator that you can move up or down in order to make certain areas more easily accessible and sort of change the way the entire level flows unfortunately because the different areas within the stage are about as visually dynamic as a cold bowl of oatmeal, the different areas end up feeling and looking exactly the same anyways. When you're required to backtrack all the way to the beginning of the level to reach the final boss, and the best possible way to do that is to take 50 leaps of faith and pray that the game doesn't ambiguously murder your ass, you may want to consider that you have a bit of a signage problem. I don't want, nor do I need, a giant flashing arrow telling me where I need to be going, but when you present me with 10 different maze-like paths to go down, I'd like to at least be positive about which ones I've already taken. You can't even use the old video game adage of, if you find enemies, you're on the right track because enemies respawn every time you die and are fucking everywhere anyways it is phenomenal how much shorter this game is when you have even a slight understanding of where you're supposed to be going and yeah i get that that's true with literally every non-linear game ever but i can't help but feel like everything being dragged out like this is at least somewhat intentional in this case given the fact that there are a grand total of like six levels in the entire game and even fewer bosses and boy oh boy do i have some shit to say about those the boss fights in this game range from surprisingly fun and engaging challenges to the absolute worst pieces of unfair dog shit that I've ever played in my entire life. And I'm just going to talk about the two on the extreme sides of that spectrum because even though there aren't that many to cover in the first, talk about the two on the but Korea that's fine. I like this. the extreme sides like of that dude. spectrum because even though there aren't that many to cover in the first place, there are only two that are interesting enough to warrant discussing any further than pointing out that they're there. The best boss in the game is the LU-74 Firebug, a two-phase boss fight where you have to take down a giant robotic spider by chopping off its legs. And when you're just starting to feel like you've got it beat, it starts flying around trying to Beyblade your ass and set you on fire. Bay -bay. And this is the point where I want to make something very clear here. This boss fight isn't good for for the surge. It is good, period. It properly telegraphs its attacks. There are a lot of different parts that you can focus on destroying, and if you pay close enough attention and are thinking on your feet, you could reasonably beat it on your first try. But more importantly than all of that, it is fun and exciting to actually fight it. Funnily enough, my biggest complaint would be that I think it's a little bit too easy, as I didn't really get to fight it long enough to really appreciate how much fun I was having. Maybe that's for the best though, given the way this game handles its longer boss fights. The boss that immediately follows a firebug is a hostile industrial manufacturing and material transportation machine controlled by a central brain that's codenamed the Big Sister. Yes, it's an evil crane. 
In this dark and moody game about the potential end of mankind at the hands of a nanite virus that slowly eats you alive from the inside out, you do fight an evil crane. And what would you do yes. if I told you that this boss is better from a narrative standpoint than a gameplay one? The fight itself is broken up into three different sections that are each awful in their own unique way, yes. with phase two being my personal least favorite. In this phase, you have to fight off four arms that all attack you at once in a cramped area while the camera flails around trying to figure out what you're trying to target. I thought that the best strategy in this phase would be to focus on damaging one arm at a time because they fall off when you hit them enough. But even in trying that, one of the arms just continued attacking me after it fell through the floor. Not to mention, if you wander too close to the brain too soon, you can accidentally trigger the final phase camera, which zooms out to a completely different angle altogether while the arms continue to maul you. Or at least I assume that's what's happening. It's a bit hard to make it out through the alcohol-induced haze and fucking arms. This has to be one of the worst boss fights I have played in my entire life life. And here's the kicker. It's still not the one that I hate the most. Oh, because while it may play one. like a broken accordion made of razor blades, it was at least a fucking idea. Compare that to the, the Black Cerberus, the oh. second to last boss in the entire game, which just involves fighting the first boss over and over again with an interlude of punching on with a normal enemy that they've strapped blue lights to. I get the whole, oh boy, this earth is not well thing you've got going on with the story, and I appreciate that you're doing what you can to help out, but this isn't the sort of recycling cycling that's gonna help fix it. Did you think that the rest of the game had such a vibrant rainbow of enemy types that no one would notice? For the vast majority of the game's runtime, you'll almost exclusively be fighting off hordes of brain-dead ex-employees of Creo in power armor who mindlessly walk towards you while snarling and growling. And no, they are not zombies. The chips connecting their brains to their suits were fried when the surge happened, which caused them to be reduced to their primal instincts of wandering around without any kind of consciousness and immediately attacking every non-brain-dead thing they come into contact with. There's and zombies. I can already hear you saying, gee, Shammy, that should have sound pretty functionally identical to zombies, and I can see why you might think that. Aside from these enemies, you'll most often <laughs> like be fighting security dudes, stabs, security dudes with stabs, security dudes with flamethrowers, and the heavy-duty black Cerberus security dudes with hammers. And this is the point where you should be recognizing a bit of a pattern, Nemo. Aside from a few robots and drones here and there, you'll wind up almost exclusively fighting variations of dudes. And I'm not anti-dude or anything, but if variety is the spice of life, this game is a saltine sandwich on white. I get that the setting is pretty restrictive if you want to maintain a solid level of believability, but this is a game where you fight an evil crane in a facility whose security was entirely staffed by murderers. I'm not positive I'd call that grounded to begin with. Hell, there are already normal enemies in this game that I can't for the life of me make sense of. The robots in central processing are pretty clearly designed to repair machinery, but what the fuck are the weird spider robot dogs in the Resolve Labs designed to do? Infuriate me specifically? Well, yes. tough luck, fuck boys, because y'all got beat out by the shitty utopia blobs in the nucleus that can only be killed by overloading them. Because if there's one thing this microwave vasectomy of a video game needed it was new and exciting ways to break the microwave oh boy because y'all got beat out by the shitty utopia blobs in the nucleus <laughs> that can only be killed by overloading them because if there's one thing this microwave vasectomy of a video game needed it was new and exciting ways to break the flow of combat nah don't even sweat it it's not at all obnoxious and tedious to have to get enemies to a specific health threshold so that you can overload them without accidentally resetting their health bar and then having to wait patiently with your big dumb metal thumb firmly stuck up your big dumb metal ass waiting for a big dumb prompt to appear it sure is a fucking relief this game doesn't have responsiveness issues with those also the act of actually overloading them just requires you to stand still and hold down the use key until they just sort of flaccidly fall apart i've been in near fatal car accidents that left me more satisfied than that shit if you're gonna force me to stand around doing nothing the least you could do is make it look interesting fortunately there are actually a few bright spots here and there in the enemy types the humanoid utopian enemies are genuinely pretty neat for no reason other than the fact that they're the only enemies in the entire game that do something interesting with the mechanics provided. The first of these that you encounter are the early stage utopian androids who come back to life after you kill them, which I know isn't exactly forget to mention that we won because of France levels of revolutionary in terms of enemy design, but the fact that you can prepare for the second phase by chopping off specific limbs and make them easier to deal with is at least interesting enough to be worth mentioning, if only because it's the first time the system is used for something other than just 
just making your numbers more numbery. The second and less interesting of the two are the late stage utopian robots who shift their armor around while you fight them. And while this does really accentuate all of the problems that the limb targeting system has in the heat of combat, I still appreciate that there was an attempt to do something different here. Here's the thing though, those enemies probably God. wouldn't have stuck out to me so much if they were in a better game. Because while they're certainly more interesting than everything else Oof. on display here, fighting Oof. them starts to get pretty repetitive pretty quickly and they eventually get relegated back to type of dude status. The repetitive nature of the Surge's combat isn't just due to the lack of enemy variety though, there's a distinct lack of weapon variety on display here as well. In total, the Surge contains five different weapon yeah. types single rigged twin rigged one handed heavy duty and staves and barring a few minor differences here and there every weapon in these categories has one of two slightly varied move sets with the only exception being a weapon you can only get by killing the final boss in a specific way which means that you have to actually beat the entire game before you even get the chance to use a weapon with a truly unique move set even worse than that the game actually incentivizes you to use as few of these classes as possible by making making your weapon proficiency scale directly with how often you use a certain weapon class rather than using well, some kind unless you want to grind the grindy game more but yeah. kind of level up system that lets you specialize in a variety of them sure you can improve your attack speed or damage a bit by wearing certain pieces of armor but proficiency determines how much the weapon's actual damage scales on top of its base stats and the biggest problem with that is that it means that maximizing your damage output requires you to restrict yourself to one maybe two weapon types so that you aren't splitting your combat proficiency five ways and while you can always upgrade your weapons with scrap the scaling plays an important part no matter what I guess this isn't as big of a deal as it would have been if I wouldn't have wound up exclusively using staves and twin rigged weapons anyways if only to ensure that I wouldn't be playing this game long enough to witness the heat death of the universe. Have I mentioned that you swing weapons way too fucking slowly in this game? It's kind of annoying how it keeps cropping up and getting in the way of everything if I'm honest. Fortunately the weapon proficiency system is probably the worst of the RPG elements in this game because the rest are perfectly passable and I'm taking every victory I can get at this point so I'm fucking hyped. Every time you kill an enemy you're given a certain amount of scrap which is used as both experience uh, for leveling up and currency and for upgrading weapons and yep. armor upon dying you lose all of the scrap that you currently have on you and have Dark a limited sauce. amount of time to retrieve it from your place of death but i discovered near the end of the game that you can actually bank all of your scrap every time you return to the med bay so i don't understand what the point of this is i mean yeah banking scrap resets your collection multiplier but returning to the med bay does that by default so what reason would i have not to bank it whatever aside from using it to upgrade your weapons and armor you can use the scrap to level up your core strength which acts as your level in game every 10 levels you unlock new ports for exosuit implants and this is where things actually start to get interesting yeah, instead these, of putting these are actually pretty different cool. skills that increase your health or damage you can instead use your core power to install different implants that you find out in the world these implants range in function from increasing your health and stamina to giving you more uses for energy like applying temporary elemental damage to your weapons and slowing down time to get a few extra hits in the catch here is that all of these implants draw power from the same core and better upgrades take up more power so you can't just stock up on all the highest level upgrades as you get them. The game requires you to actually think about what you should and shouldn't be using in order to ensure that your build is doing everything you need it to in order for you to make your way through the game as effectively as possible. It's a strong concept that's pretty clever, fairly creative, and is also seemingly well implemented. So naturally this is the part where the rest of the game rears its ugly head and skull fucks the entire concept with an old piece of pipe for making it look bad Boy. because the enemy damage numbers are so absurdly high the only worthwhile core upgrades are those damage. that increase your health and stamina or otherwise give you some kind of sustain as you work your way through the arduously long levels and multi-phase boss fights that this game is riddled with you either blow your core power on health upgrades and a bunch of huge healing injectables and pray that you don't run out or load up on upgrades that let you build up energy faster and convert that energy to health while still putting a lot of power into your health bar because healing doesn't mean shit if you can't survive the damage in the first place just about every other build is unviable unless you're willing to dedicate yourself to mastering the game's combat so that you can smugly tell other people that they should reevaluate their lives because they were too busy to do something as worthwhile as meticulously analyzing the game built around it honestly i think in the future if anyone ever asks me why i don't give games some kind of numeric score i'm just going to point them here because despite the fact that i've just spent over <sighs> half an hour burning this game with a magnifying glass i genuinely can't decide whether or not i think the surge is actually that bad 
game from a more objective standpoint. All I know for certain is that playing it makes me want to blow my entire life savings on surge protectors and promptly empty my fucking wrists. What is that, like a 7? It's probably a 7. As for Deck 13 themselves, well, despite the fact that I very clearly won't be invited to any launch parties anytime soon, I am actually kind of keen to see what they do next. I think the biggest reason I hated this game to the degree that I did was the fact that underneath all of the bullshit, I can see a really great game buried in here somewhere. Deck 13 had some pretty neat ideas that were mostly let down by piss poor execution, and it's evident that they're at the very least capable of learning from their failures. After all, even given all the shit I've said in this review, the surge is still at the absolute worst a marked improvement over Lords of the Fallen. Oh, fuck me. I actually enjoyed Lords of the Fallen a lot more than I enjoyed the Surge games. Uh, it still has fucked up controls, everything feels too slow, too fast sometimes, it's weird, combos feel weird, but I enjoyed it more than this, maybe because of the world, maybe I'm just not into sci-fi shit, I don't know. God damn it. I was born in a prison. Oi. I got you. Okay, well, we saw Shammy. Shammy is a pretty good owl. I enjoyed this video. We're probably gonna do more of Shammy. Anyway, let me know what y'all think. Like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you next time, buddy. Have a nice fucking day.